Welcome to the third Sunday of Advent. Our anticipation builds even more, even as we look at the world around us and see things that are disheartening and bleak. Still, our hope grows because we believe that change will come and that um, Jesus' work in our world will, will come. So let's join together and worship and rejoice even in these hard times. I want to note a couple of things. First, in the We Come, We Cry song, there's a typo. It should say on the refrain, in the mighty name of God. So note that when you're singing. And then um, we're going to sing three verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We are adding the third verse this week. And we will sing together. We'll join together um, again with the Prepare You the Way of the Lord song. And we're going to... Do it with more excitement and exuberance this week. So, um, here we go. The birth of Jesus was on this wise. Mary, who was espoused to Joseph, found herself with child of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, Mary was greatly pleased that she had found favor in the eyes of God. Joseph, on the other hand, was somewhat disturbed by this phenomenon. We pick up our story as Joseph ponders whether he will take Mary as his wife. Joseph, in his thoughts, I can't believe Mary did this to me. What in the world was she thinking? She tells me this baby is of the Holy Spirit, but how can this be? How can God do such a thing? What am I supposed to do? We're supposed to get married. What are people going to think? And she tells me that this child is special. Indeed he is because he's not from me. I just don't know what to do. I feel so 
dejected, confused at this point. I've thought on this and thought on this to the point that I am exhausted. I will lay down and rest. And perhaps the Lord will reveal to me what I am to do. Joseph sleeps and he tosses and turns and an angel of the Lord appears unto him. Joseph, son of David, fear not, for that which is conceived in Mary is of the Holy Ghost. He will be the Messiah. He will bring salvation to his people. Do not be afraid, for you have chosen of men to be the father, the earthly father of this great Messiah and King. Peace be with you. Rest, my son of David, and know that God is with you. Oh, my. Forgive me, Father, for doubting that you were the, you were the son, you were the creator of this being within Mary. I shall not postpone any longer. I will make haste and take Mary as my wife, and we will be one couple and we will dedicate this child to you. As you have said, he will be the savior of the world. He is the true Messiah who was spoken of by the prophets, that a virgin shall come forth and bear a child, and we shall call his name Jesus. Father, I doubt you no more. I shall go to Mary and give her the news. For our message this morning, I have uh, given you all two passages of scripture to consider uh, for the grounding of our message this morning about what it means to be a surrogate. The Advent season focuses on the life of Mary as the surrogate mother of Jesus. However, the Bible is full of passages that speaks to surrogacy starting all the way back in the place of our hearing this morning in the text of Genesis. And so for that reason, I decided for this Advent season to focus a little bit more on surrogacy from the standpoint of the whole history of the Bible and its relationship from the beginning of creation until the beginning of the church and Christendom and what it means to be a surrogate in God's eyes. And so for this message this morning or this conversation, I've, enti I've titled this message, The Surrogate, subtitle, Without You, God Can Do Nothing. And this particular passage uh, was lifted from a uh, saying by St. Augustine, and then also uh, Bishop Tutu uh, restated or rephrased it in his own words. And I feel like this saying has been lost in Christian history because oftentimes we focus so much on Jesus that we forget our responsibility to Jesus. And so uh, St. Augustine says it this way. He says, without God, you can do nothing. Who agrees with that? I agree. Without God, you can't do nothing, right? But then the other part of the phrase is, without you, God can do nothing. And oftentimes in Christianity, we focus on, without God, I can do nothing. We're waiting, we're shouting, we're jumping pews, we're praying, we're hoping. And, and we're waiting on God. But then God, in answering our prayers, sometimes suggests to us that we've mis, misread Jesus' purpose for being here and the Holy Spirit's purpose for being in us. And God is saying, I'm waiting on you. And so this particular message deals with the fact that God is waiting on us. So here we have in Advent two types of waiting happening in this season. One, God of us waiting on God, and then the other aspect of waiting, God is waiting on us. And these two types of waitings need to be held in tension, perfect tension, because what Jesus did in his coming was to build a collaborative relationship between humankind and God, where God and human beings become co-creators. And that in order for God's plan for humankind to work perfectly, that humankind has to realize that they have been vested with certain gifts and talents and abilities given to them by the Holy Spirit that empowers them now 
to do the very thing they've been waiting on God to do. Are y'all with me? So this particular dilemma started in the gospel, I'm sorry, in the book of Genesis when God created Adam. Everybody remember the story of Adam and Eve? And we realized that Adam, when he was created, God breathed into Adam's body, just for metaphor purposes, his spirit, and Adam came alive. And then Adam uh, also, in one passage of the creation story, was used as now the person from whom God, woman, takes part of him and now uses that as the material to construct another body and breathes into that body a female body, the spirit of God, and that body comes alive. And then the other passage in creation, there's two creation passages. That was the first one. The second one says God created male and female equally, created them together and breathed into them the spirit of God equally, and they both came alive. So mankind can do nothing in this world without the spirit of God living and moving and having his being and presence inside of them, giving them life. But Mankind was designed to be caretakers over the Garden of Eden so that the stewardship of the garden, the, the managing of the garden, was mankind's responsibility or humankind's responsibility. And God cannot manage the garden without somebody there present in the garden for it to be managed by. Are y'all with me? So there is, a pur- there is a reason why God created humankind. They were purpose to be the stewards of God's creation. But with the fall of man, the fall of Adam and Eve, we lost our way. We lost our purpose. This is why Paul says Jesus is the second Adam who has come again, God bringing somebody in bodily form, putting in them the spirit of God to now become the second representation of Adam to a new generation to show them how they are supposed to behave and live in this world as Adam did in the garden. But the problem was, God had to deal first with our sins. If sin is what caused us to get out of the way and allow for the world to go on the path without our stewardship, then the removal of sin will allow for us to find our way again and now become the stewards of the world so the world can experience God giving life again. Are y'all with me? And so Jesus becomes the second Adam. He comes into the world. This is what we're hoping and expecting for, right, in this season. To remove the sins of Adam from the world and Eve. But then the second waiting is for now that spirit that was in Jesus to now being us so that we can now rebuild the Garden of Eden, if you will, just for metaphor purposes, right? So our waiting for Jesus has been fulfilled, and we remember this now. But God's waiting for us has yet to be fulfilled. Because when you see the God's people following the life and the legacy of Jesus, doing what Jesus did in the world, you will see among his people fruit being born wherever they go. Life being born wherever they go. Creation coming alive. It's almost like anything in the ground that's a seed and the, 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 the Christian walks by, all of a sudden the plant will begin to grow out of the ground because life is just going through their bodies. Are y'all with me? Somebody that's sad, crying over the loss of their loved one, when a Christian walks by them, they, they feel the energy from their body go into their body. And they experience the, 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 the grief turning into joy. Huh? The mourning turning into dance. You see, this is the, what the Spirit of God does through the body of one who follows God. So this power, this miraculous power that Jesus had when he walked through the streets of Jerusalem or walked through the countryside and that people were able to touch him and draw from him power by their faith that they had not had experienced before, then why are we not able to do these things? You tell them, you walk by them, you say, keep on praying, baby. Just wait on God. God going to send you himself to, 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 to answer your prayers. And God is saying, no, I'm waiting on you. Why do you think you're there? And they have a need, and you're right there to respond to that need. Why are you telling them to wait on God when God is saying, I put you there because they were really waiting on you? And you showed up, but you showed up barren. You showed up not able to produce 
what God said you should produce. So my witness today is that the church is barren because the church is not producing life. It is taking life. The church is supposed to be a birthing center, a birthing clinic that produces life. But the church has become an abortion clinic that takes life before it is even born. The church has become a hemorrhaging clinic that causes miscarriages when people come into the church and they want to give God their all. And the church, because it's toxic, it's hypocritical, it's so focused on itself that people who come in with gifts and destinies that we fulfill in this world, they're aborted, they're miscarried, and then the land and the people and the community is laid in waste. Are y'all with me? Why? Because the church forgot that it was God's surrogate. That life that could not be given anywhere else in the world was supposed to be found in the church. And there is a role that the church plays in helping others realize their God-given potential. So this passage in Hagar talks about an individual, a woman, being God's surrogate to bring into existence Abraham's first son, Ishmael, and how her role as an individual is symbolic of what I believe the metaphor being for the church. Because God does not choose people who are status quo, people who got it all together, people whose lives are uh, flawless, to bring into existence those who would change the world for the better. God always seems to choose those who are seen to be the least worthy, the least deserving, the least ones who are seen to be, and like in high school, the most successful or will be the most successful. And those are the ones God seems to choose to bear witness of God's ability to give life. Why is that? Because the only way to testify that God can give life it's by choosing somebody who seemed to be already dead. Are y'all with me? This is why God can't take self-righteous people and make them into instruments for his, his, his doing and his will, because self-righteous people think they've already been resurrected. And they don't realize they're dead. Jesus said to the Pharisees and Sadducees, inside of you dwell dead men bones. You're spiritually dead, but outside you got all these robes and trinkets, rings and hats and everything else, and you feel like you're righteous, but inside you're dead. But God said, come here, prostitute. Come here, tax collector. Come here, uh, single mother. Come here, uh, 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 demon possessed. They think you're all worthless. They think you're undeserved. They think you're dead, but I'm going to show you that life can come from those who are dead. Okay, so we see that this is a problem because the church has become full of people who are inwardly barren, but outwardly righteous. And God wants some people to be inwardly fruitful and outwardly fruitful. So how does God do that? God has to now put his spirit in us to resurrect us, to revive us, to live the life that God has created us to live. So how are we supposed to do this? The purpose of surrogacy from the individual standpoint is that you as an individual, you are God's surrogate. Y'all with me? So what does a surrogate do? A surrogate says that the person who wants to bring a child in the world is unable to do that. I have a womb that is, that is fertile and that is healthy and that now God can use this womb to bring life through even though I did not intend at first for, to be the vessel that God chose. The dead, right? So you are all God's surrogate. And the Holy Spirit is the one that wants to possess you, that wants to fill you so that God can use you to bring new life into this world. So who is your partner? Mary, who is your partner? Is it Joseph? No, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Mary's partner. Mary is the surrogate. The Holy Spirit is the partner. Holy Spirit visits Mary, gives her the ability to create new life. 
Same way he visited you and I when we were filled with the Holy Spirit. But every surrogate, every mother needs a doula or a midwife in this tradition to stand with them and to help walk them through the pregnancy process so that when they come to term, that they're there waiting expect, expect, expectantly to bring into the world with them the new life. Are y'all with me? So our responsibility as individuals is to prepare ourselves to be surrogates, prepare our vessels to be God's surrogate vessel. But the church responsibility is to be our doula or our midwife to help stand with us and partner with us so that we can come to full term and give birth to what God expected us to, to give birth to. Are y'all with me? So the church cannot play the role of the surrogate as, of the surrogate as an institution, because that's the individual's responsibility. But as an institution, it can play the role of a midwife or a, or a doula. And that is to assist people in giving birth to their God-given destiny and purpose. So let me give you some characteristics of what if the church is wanting to become, uh, church wanting to become this doula, this midwife, what they first must understand is that as a doula, your role is to assist every person who enters into the institution before they're pregnant, during their pregnancy, and then after they're pregnant in order to ensure that they come to term and that the child that they produce is healthy. Now understand, I'm using metaphors, the child can be anything that gives life. It can be your profession. It can be your relationship with your children. It can be your relationship with your neighbors. It can be anything that bears spiritual fruit. That's your child, okay? And so the church is supposed to be here to help us come to term, uh, full term, to bear these, these spiritual gifts or children into the world. Now, so the role of the doula is to be there before, during, and after birth. And the doula, or the midwife to church, is there before birth because they're there to provide resources for the people according to what they need in their pregnancy process. Now, how many women have had children? I've never had a child physically. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm speaking from a technical, scientific, clinical standpoint. I can't speak from firsthand experience. But what I've read, <laughs> And what I understand, women, y'all can use amens up in here, right? Is that while you're carrying the weight for this expectant baby, that you need somebody to be there to care for you. Because you don't know, bef before you're pregnant, you don't know how you're going to handle your pregnancy. Are y'all with me? And so you need someone to be there for you, to care for you through the pregnancy. And so... The reason you need someone to be there is because there may be complications along the way. And so this is how the church helps people as a doula. There may be complications. Every woman's complication is different from another. So a person who comes in here who comes from a drug-addicted family, they already have complications at home that can abort their ability to provide new life and to be a spiritual vessel that God can use. Are you with me? That can cause miscarriage. So the church receives this person who has a drug-addicted mother or father, or may even be experiencing drug addiction themselves and needs to go through a recovery process. They need you to care for them because they may have complications. And you have to be skilled in order to know how to deal and provide resources for the complications that may arise that can now challenge the pregnancy. Are y'all with me? So you have to be caring, you have to be able to deal with the complications, and you also have to be able to deal with the what they call contractions, women, and pregnant women, have y'all had contractions, right? Contractions can be misleading. Sometimes contractions says you're ready to give birth to the thing that you're carrying. But we know that a spiritual and wise doula knows, or physician knows, sometimes these contractions can be premature and you're not ready to give birth. But what happens when we allow people to come into the congregation, assume roles of leadership or positions, or say they're gifted in a certain area, and they don't have no one to care for them, to understand the complications, and when they start contracting, saying, God is ready to give birth to me becoming a minister, or give birth to me becoming a deacon, or give birth to me becoming a trustee, or birth to me becoming a child care provider, or whatever, 
you're able to say, hold up. The way you responded to the complications show that you are not mature enough yet to assume that responsibility. Y'all with me? I'm trying to help us understand how to prevent abortion and miscarriages in the body of Christ so that we can begin to bear fruit. The other thing, but providing resources, we got to be willing to be compassionate, and that is to provide a way of giving in exchange with others the things that they need to sustain their life. Paul says in this passage of Corinthians, we're all made up of many parts, many members. And we know organs in the body, one organ supplies resources to another organ. And the heart cannot say to the liver, I have no need of thee. The lungs cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, right? So when your hand is crippled, there's another part of your body that supplies resources or accommodates the crippling of that hand, right? To make sure now that you can still move in a way to sustain your life. I deal all the time with people in a disabled community who have physical and intellectual disabilities, and they find ways to compensate the things that they can't do by leaning on stronger parts of their body. So if their leg is not working properly, they use a stronger leg to balance themselves. Are y'all with me? And so this is how the body works. So what happens when someone is weak among us who needs to be accommodated and we don't have enough compassion towards them to now say to them, if I don't sustain you in your weakness, then the whole body is going to suffer. This is what Paul was dealing with. There was division in Corinth. Corinth. There was sabotage and, and subversion happening in Corinth. The community was breaking down and being divided, and those who were being trampled upon, those who were being harmed in the community, Paul was saying, where is your compassion for these people? Because if you don't deal with their suffering in the body, because you see yourself as stronger, I don't have to worry, I have a house, I, my mortgage is paid, my car is paid for, my bills are paid for, and I can't help because those jokers over there didn't have enough sense to get the education like I had. I'm stronger, I'm better, I'm more noble. And so Paul is saying, no, if you allow for them to be harmed or weakened, because they're having complications, then the whole body is having complications. Are y'all with me? And so we have to be the kind of doula or the resource for those who are carrying the weight for their gifts to be born that during their pregnancy, as being surrogates, that they will not abort or miscarry. So the first point is that we have to understand our role as a doula. We have to understand the second point, our resource that we provide to the members of the body as a doula. The third thing we must understand is that we have to help bring, after the child comes to term and the child is delivered, we have to be willing to release people into the world, to give to the world the life that they have showed among us that they're able to give to our community. Here's the problem. Oftentimes, we think that releasing means that they cannot come back. So when you release someone into the world and you say that they're strong and they should now be able to stand on their own, Sometimes we don't believe that they should return and need the same things they originally need before we let them go. So here's where the body of Christ messes up also. Because in the releasing and the sharing of the gifts of the Spirit that comes to that person's life, they may become injured. They may become harmed. They may lose everything in the process. And the church is not supposed to judge them when they return after their release but it's supposed to receive them back as if they had never went through the process of spiritual development or growth. You know how we do, right? The rich young ruler, I'm sorry, no, the prodigal son. We think that because a person leaves strong, they should come back strong. And if not, we should judge them and persecute them for now failing at their task. So, but if we are a resource, they should be able to return to us after they're released into the world. As a parent, if you release your child from the home just because they made it to 18, does not mean that your responsibility as a parent ends at 18. At some point, they should be able to return, all right? So we are a resource, and we are to release them, but also after birth, we are to let them return so that now they can regenerate. Are y'all with me? 
Here is where the church as an institution runs into some serious problems because we are not a regeneration station. When the world injures one of our own, we seem to not know how to give people second chances. We know how to give them chances when, before they get saved, God going to give you a second chance. The grace of God, you know, God loves the sinner, hate the sin. The grace of God, come now as you are. God is going to give you a second chance. But what happens when the pastor falls from grace? The bishop falls from grace. The president of a company falls from grace. The corporate CEO falls from grace. Are y'all with me? What happens when you reach a certain level in society and now you're supposed to be one who bears all things, hopeth all things, believeth all things, and now you end, now something leads to your demise, where is that person's second chance? Are y'all with me? What happens now when they need to return to the place of their origin, where they were birthed from, and receive another chance? So we're supposed to go through this regeneration process. But let me help you understand this from an organism standpoint. This regeneration process looks similar to the process of the regeneration of the liver. You can take less than 25% of the liver and take the other 75% away. And out of that 25%, you give that liver time as it exists in the body, it will begin to grow back to its normal size. Are y'all with me? That's regeneration. Sometimes the church needs to be a refuge for people so they can have time to come back to the place of their birthing and to have time for you to go in and find out and diagnose what was the spiritual problem and now remove that piece of their life or give them opportunity to remove that thing from their life. To now, so, so now they find the sanctuary to grow back again the strength that they had before, before they're able to now return to the world. Why is this important? I'm talking about Jesus. Jesus understood his role as the Messiah. He came as a child who went through the natural process of development from childhood to adolescence to adulthood. Then he became a resource for the world. Then he was able to, at that point, release to the world the gifts that God gave him as a spiritual leader. But then Jesus himself went through this process of the Garden of Gethsemane. God, I don't know if I can continue on. Do I need to? Can I, can I, can I let go and turn back and quit? Must I go to the cross? And God says to Jesus, after Jesus prays to him several times, you have to finish the course. And so Jesus and the world is waiting for this point when Jesus reaches Calvary. And he says on the cross, it is finished. And now his body, his physical body, is broken down. And he lets go of his last breath and gives up the spirit. But now he atones for the sins of the world. Watch this. But Jesus had to go through a regeneration process because that's the sign of resurrection. To be a Christian the sign of your growth and your strength is not can you live, but can you die and live again. So Jesus goes through the regeneration process. Now the world is looking for a sign. You gave me Jesus, yeah. He was big, bad, bold, courageous, stood up to kings, stood up to, to queens, stood up to leaders in the community, did all that, crucified, died. You say he's resurrected. Show me your resurrection. So here come Thomas, talking to the disciples. Thomas says, I don't believe what y'all say about Jesus. I saw him die. I saw him crucify him. I even saw him buried. I don't believe in this resurrection. What are you waiting for? What are you hoping for? Until I see the nail prints in his hand, until I see the wound created on his side, I won't believe. But watch what Jesus does. Jesus comes back from his crucifixion. He's resurrected, regenerated. He says to Thomas, Thomas, put your hand 
finger right here. Reach into my side. Why? Because people need verification that if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, if you're going to become like Jesus, you must be able to die and be reborn and reborn again. Why is generation important? Because in regeneration, other than outside of other injuries, in regeneration, there are no scars left. Can you be hurt, wounded, but not scarred? That is the testimony of your Christian walk. Regeneration happens as a result of resurrection. And if we don't create a space where people can come and to be safe enough, to feel safe enough, to open themselves up to the wounds and scars they've experienced in life, to go through the healing process over and over again so that when they go into the world and they say, man, I, I saw you on the street corner the other day. Man, you had lost everything, your job and everything. How is it now you're back looking for employment? How is it now you're back in school? How is it now you're back with your family? How was you restored? Tell me about the things that you did that made it possible for you to live this life again. It's regeneration. The testimony or your fruitfulness as a church of our fruitfulness as surrogates is can we produce people who are regenerated? That the scars that once exist no longer exist. That the presence of death in their life is no longer present, but they're being people who bring forth life in every breath, in every action, in every deed. Can we be a church that allows for the process of everyone here as we come together as the body of Christ and move together as the body of Christ? Can we understand our role as a doula? Can we provide the resources necessary to make sure that everybody have what they need throughout their pregnancy? Can we allow for them to make it to term so they can release to the world the gifts that God has given them? And then can we allow for them to return when necessary to find the ability and the way to regenerate the gifts that God has given them so they can go back into the world and show the world what resurrection looks like? That's what God has sent the church to do in the world, is to be the sinners where people can know that there's life coming from that place. There's healing coming from that place. There's deliverance coming from that place. So let me end with this. We, as Christians, in 2015, we're no longer waiting for the Messiah. Not Jesus. He's already come. We are in the messianic age. What we are waiting on is for new Christians to be born, to continue to be new messiahs. Because Jesus said, greater works shall you do than I have done. I'm one messiah, but when the spirit of God comes, I would make many messiahs. So now we wait with expectation, not for Jesus, but for every child that's born in the Christian community, every person in the Christian community becomes a new Messiah. Watch this now. So when you say, I'm waiting on God, because without God, you can do nothing. God is saying, I have given you my spirit. I have let you go through the doula process of regeneration, now I am waiting on you to do something. Are y'all ready to be the Messiah's children? Are y'all ready to claim your Messiahship through the Holy Spirit and bear life into the world so that the world would know what must I do to be saved is to come to the very place where salvation is and experience my role now as a surrogate for Jesus. Are y'all with me? And so I leave you with this. Without God, truly, you can do nothing. But without you, God can do nothing. Amen.